Can you clap your hands one more time to the Lord? Amen. Amen. If you can remain standing on your way back to your seats. God's presence is here. And uh, such a wonderful anointing that's in this place. feel to talk to you tonight so whenever whenever I preach I always have my timer with me especially when I'm teaching hallelujah and uh, it's just been a tremendous privilege being here with you guys and uh, honestly I, I have something in my spirit to talk to you about very simple but very important. And I believe that many of you, this will help and change your life now. And it'll give you some preventive measures for the future. And I keep wanting to get into uh, a text, but really the Bible is just so ingrained with this, I really can't settle on a text to really read to you. But I do have a title for you. <laughs> I've settled on the title. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is I want to talk about relationships. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about relationships and how important it is to have the proper relationships uh, to be what God has created us to be. Can you clap your hands on your way being seated? <laughs> Amen. Uh, this this might be, I feel like we've broken through some things in this back to school revival feel like it's going to build even more uh, tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. And I feel like it got, broke through some things, really. One of the reasons is maybe so you can receive what I have to say tonight. And uh, that the word can go forth with free course. Everyone say relationships. Relationships have been the catapult for ministries. And it's also been the pitfall of ministries. Did you know that getting in the wrong relationship can drastically affect your walk with God. Did any of you know that? It's so important that we are connected with the right people. I've seen too many young people that are on fire, and every time they're on fire, the enemy will send a relationship. And that relationship immediately quenches that fire. And as long as that relationship lasts, uh, you don't pray anymore. You don't show up to all the events anymore because you got a date night. My, I started off rough. Come on, somebody. Just smile out there. Uh, I can't come to youth service. I... Me and my boo, we, 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 we go on to Dave and Buster's and play a few video games. And <laughs> People are squirming already. I ain't even got my, 
I, I must I must have stepped right into the vein. Uh, uh, relationships, it can. You have to be very careful with the relationships you in, want to enter into. Can I can I give you a revelation on how you know a relationship is out of the will of God? Very simple. You want to know? You want to know uh, how you know a relationship is out of the will of God? Is if it's secret. I'm in trouble in this house. If it's secret, that's a red flag. Because if you knew everyone would approve of it, you would have no problem letting the light shine on it. And it's amazing how church, church, church folk know how to play it cool. Meaning, y'all can be sitting in the same section. Y'all don't even make eye contact one time. But as soon as church is over, send that text message. Like, hey, you prayed really well today, by the way. I love those tears. I love the way your tricep reached over and laid your hand on that person and it's really working out. But then in church you're like this. That's how you know it's out of the will of God is if it's secret. Secrets have destroyed a lot of young people. You know what happens with secrets when you have secrets? What happens is when you have secrets and a soul tie that nobody knows about, when you come into the house of God because you're so used to living in secret, it's tough for you to open up to God. Because you're in a relationship that nobody knows about, so you don't know how to be real anymore. You don't know how to be authentic. And it's tough for you to be authentic with God when you're always carrying around something you're hiding. Somebody get around you, you're doing anything. What you, what you texting that we can't see? Uh. Uh, help me, Holy Ghost. Secrets have destroyed young people. And honestly, your secrets are a bridge to living a double life. And so, who you are connected to can drastically affect you. Some of you are so... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? So uh, romantic? I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? What? Uh, you live off of romance. Like you, you, you can't wait to find the right one. Whether you are a girl or a guy, you can't wait to find the right one. And so the enemy knows where your weakness is. So he will pull out somebody to entertain that weakness. And it's not going anywhere. So you're in this relationship for six months, not working on your walk with God, not, not doing what you need to do. And then it ends and you just wasted six months. I know that's happened to a few of y'all here. I'm talking to you. And so it is crucial to develop the proper relationships in order to have an efficient and effective walk with the Lord. Somebody say amen. Somebody, everybody just put on a smile for a second. Hold on. Let me see the smiles. All right. 
for a head. Uh huh. A few fake ones, hallelujah. <laughs> Moving on. I've seen too many ministries destroyed by being connected to the wrong individual. This is why Abraham, Abraham, he's about to die, and his son Isaac is 40 years old. He's 40 years old, and Isaac isn't married yet. And so Abraham tells his most trusted servant, and he says, he says, look, I need you to go travel on a 550 mile journey to find my son a wife i don't want her from where we are in this canaanite territory i need you to go on a 550 mile journey and find my son the right wife because if he marries the wrong one the covenant is in jeopardy uh, you can't just choose anybody for this covenant. I need you to go on a 550 mile journey to find the right one. There's the revelation. It is better to wait and travel far to marry the right one than to marry the wrong one because you're lonely and they're in a convenient location. It, uh, <laughs> It's better to wait than to get so lonely, people you would never talk to all of a sudden start looking cute. I'm being real tonight. You would have never talked to them three years ago, but all of a sudden you're lonely and your prospects are being minimized. And so finally, finally that they start, they, they think they have no hope, but then all of a sudden you're like, uh, I, I, I'm still interested. Like, like, you know what, that your crooked nose isn't that bad anymore. You know, I can, I can work with the crooked nose, you know, uh, I'm lonely. You know, the eyebrows, I, we can work on it, I, you know, the. The the, 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 the the three moles on the top of your lip, it's fine. I can we can have surgery. Everything's gonna work out and we can it's amazing how people start looking more attractive when you're lonely. Like, like you know what, you know what that uh, <laughs> I better chill out. You know, it's not, it's, it's not that bad. You know, we can't, we can work it. Well, but you said you would never talk to him because he was ugly. I know, but there's something cute about his ugliness. Like, oh, I, I never thought of it that way. I've just been so lonely and they're the only one interested and I know it's not God's will. But at least I'll just to help my loneliness, at least I'll just kind of flirt with it a little bit. Lead them on. I got a crush on them, but they're not interested, and you're ugly, but you like me, so we'll text until they're interested. Oh, y'all act like that don't happen. Ooh, man, are there any humans in this building? Like, 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 I'm really waiting on them, but, you know, hey, don't talk to me in public. I better stop. I better chill out. I just stepped right in the vein, didn't I? I mean, I just, no, just pulled no punches. Didn't build up. Just, ha, ah, here I am. What's that? What's that? And so Abraham sends this servant on this 550 mile journey to find the right one. And this servant brings his 10, 10 camels to express the wealth of his master. 
and he puts the wealth on the camels. He goes on the journey, 550 miles, 21 day journey. He finally gets to the place and there is a well and this servant prays this prayer. He says, Lord, let the woman that offers me water and my camel's water, let her be the one. Amen. That's a peculiar prayer. You start praying some peculiar prayers when you're lonely. Lord Jesus, if, he should, if she just lift up her left hand one time in service, let that, oh, let that be the one. Jesus, if, it, if he blinked two times and, uh, during the worship, Lord, let, let that be the one. Lord, she don't have to come to the altar. Let her just hesitate. And if she hesitate to come, Lord, let, let that be. If she wearing blue tonight, God, let that be my word. Oh, turquoise will do. <laughs> Start praying some peculiar prayers when you're lonely. That's a peculiar prayer that this man prays. You know, it's peculiar, but it's a powerful prayer because it was very common for a young lady to offer a stranger water. But it was very uncommon for her to offer the camel's water because when you offer the camel's water, you don't know when the camel's going to be done drinking. And he had 10. And the Bible says that Rebecca offered him and his camel's water. And a thirsty camel can drink 30 gallons of water in 15 minutes. He had 10 that came from a 550 mile journey. And she was willing to draw 2,500 pounds of water for someone she didn't know. She was willing to draw 300 gallons of water for someone she had never met. And the Bible says that she hasted. It wasn't like no water hose. It was a well. Bible says she gave every camel to drink until they were filled. And she didn't realize that the servanthood that she was doing now was tied to her destiny. She did not realize her service that she was accomplishing now uh, was tied to her becoming the most powerful woman in the clan, uh, the matriarch. What, what the servant wanted to know is that I got to choose somebody uh, that's doing something for God now. Uh, you, if they're not worshiping now, you better run away. Uh, if they're not loving holiness now, you better run away. Uh, if they don't respect leadership now, you better run away. You have the worst decision you can make is choose a spouse based off of their potential. You have to choose from what they're doing now. They don't have a relationship with God now. Don't think just because you're in a relationship with them that you're going to draw them into a relationship with the Lord. Some people say, well, when we get married, they'll be more faithful. You know how many times I've seen that play out and they get married and he just don't come to church anymore? But now they, they, he got you tied. Now how you, now how you going to have an effective ministry? Hello? You have to judge them. The worst thing you could do is be like, yeah, 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 we're in a relationship. Well, well, what is, well, well they're a future prayer warrior. No. He, he loves God in the future. Hello? 
The worst thing you could do is choose off of potential. You have to see where they are now. Can I tell you another thing to do? The worst thing that you could do is to choose a spouse, choose someone to get in a relationship off of one youth camp. Oh, I got some confused looks out there. Hello? The worst thing you could do is choose a spouse Someone to get a relationship with off of one youth conference. Well, Brother Jackson, why? Let me tell you why. Because I don't know how many times I've preached a youth camp. And after I do this youth camp, I preach at one of the local churches. And I start telling this pastor Man, let me tell you something. Your young people, they were on the front row. They were reading their Bible. They were taking notes. They were praying people through the Holy Ghost. And the pastor's looking at me like this. Are you serious? I said, oh, yeah, they were leading by example. He said, that's interesting because at home they sit on the back row. And they text the whole service. Yeah, you think you got a good catch because they're in the altar at camp. Am I speaking alien tonight? You can't choose off of one event. That's why it's instrumental to have a pastor and a pastor's wife involved in your decision. Before your emotions get tied. Somebody say, that's good teaching. It's crucial to have leadership involved with your decision before your emotions get entangled. Some people, they get in a relationship, in a relationship for a year that nobody knows about, and then they go to pastor and say, Pastor, what do you think? And if he says no, you want to backslide and leave the church because you're like, Pastor, you don't even know him. I know it's the first time I've heard of them. Why didn't you come to me before you got emotionally wrapped into it? So if I told you no, you would have no problem disconnecting. Before. You need pastoral guidance and counsel and your relationship decisions. With me and Louisa, before I ever told her that I was interested in her, number one, I watched her walk with God. Number two, I called my pastor and said, Pastor, what do you think? And my pastor said, well, let me call her pastor. And my pastor called her pastor and got the whole background check on her. Social security. Where she went to middle school. And my pastor called me back and said, I feel good about it. See, there is a safety in that. Because if they're putting on a show out in front of everybody... They have a pastor that can tell you, no, no, no. This is the real them at home. They're not just putting on a show at camp. I watch their walk with God. It is instrumental to have a leadership involved. With your decisions. There's a covering. that You have too much destiny for you to hold it all in your own hands. That's why you have leadership. Anytime I ever even thought about 
being interested. I went to pastor, pastor, what do you think? And he'd be like, "Mm, no. Okay, no big deal. Watch this. They didn't even know I was thinking about it. See, some, so too many of y'all ruin friendships because you get in this texting and calling and talking, boo boo, baby, three hours. And then you found out it doesn't work out. And now you never talk to them in the youth group anymore. Y'all act like each other don't exist. It's like they're they're there. Like, Y'all had the same house playing games and you got your back towards each other. I'm hitting people between the eyes right now. See, you didn't have leadership involved. Now you damaged the friendship. So I'd always go to Pastor, Pastor, what do you think? Pastor, what do you think? And with Louisa, it's interesting because with Louisa, I preached at her church February 16th, 2011. I preached at her church. And she was the church secretary. She was the, uh, one of the youth leaders on the youth team. And I didn't even know her name. I didn't even talk to her or anything. But a year and a half later, God speaks to me. He goes, Victor, you're about to get married. I'm not even talking to anybody. What do you mean I'm about to get married? And literally, her face came into my mind. And I was like, what's her name? What is her name? So I went where you're supposed to find somebody's name. I went to Facebook. I went to my friend who was the assistant pastor of her church. I went to his Facebook and I started looking for her face. And her name starts with an L. Said he's got like thousands of friends. And so I'm like, and then I saw that smile. I was like, okay, here we go. The Lord said, I'm about to get married, so here we go. I sent that friend request. (laughs) She accepted. I'm like, "Ah!" (laughs) And so I said, I got to play it cool. I got to play it cool. God said, I'm about to get married, so I got to play it cool. So I sent her a message. I said, hey, how you doing? She sent back, fine. I was like, okay, rough start, rough start. Here we go. I said, uh, how's the church been? She's like, good. Uh, what's new that's going on in your life since I last saw you? Nothing much. Lord, am I hearing from you? Okay. And so I was going on a media fast for a week. And so I was like, man, I want to continue this uplifting conversation (laughs) outside of the media. Because I'm not going to be able to talk to her for a week. So I said, hey, do you mind if I have your number so we can speak outside of social media? She didn't respond. I come back after the week media fast. I come back. There's still no response. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I done offended this girl. And so I said, hey, I'm sorry if I offended you. And she sent back, it's fine. Okay. Two weeks later, my church had had a conference. And her church came to the conference. I was on the platform. I was about to go say hello to her. But the Lord spoke to me. He said, don't you say a word to her. I was like, Lord, you're really sending me mixed signals. Did I blow it that bad where you got to find a new wife for me? He said, don't you say a word to her. I said, okay. I didn't talk to her and didn't say anything. And then two weeks after that conference, I felt to send her another message on Facebook, which I never do. It's completely against who I am. So I just said again, 
hey, how you doing? And she sent back, I'm doing fine. What about you? And I was like, And we started having a nice conversation, and it was going too good. I was like, oh, I don't want to blow it. I'm, this is going too well. And so I said, hey, here's my number if you ever want to uh, talk outside of the media. May 31st, 2012 was our first text message. Mm. Mm. I felt a witness. I felt a witness just now. The next day, May 31st, 2012. And so we text and we just kind of text. Didn't flirt one time. Just literally conversation. Just, just talking. Literally, I had a whole questionnaire out. Where do you see yourself in five years? Are you hearing me right now? Where do you, where do you see yourself in five years? Can you see yourself traveling? How, 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 do, do you see yourself, you know? I, I was just getting all the info on her. It was all. Uh, it was no flirtation, just information. And so as I'm getting all this information about her and everything like that, and uh, she thought it was weird. Yeah, and I'm still weird. Amen. She's like, she's like, you're, she's like, you were such a weirdo. I'm still a weirdo, but she learned to like my weirdness. Hallelujah. Paid off for me. Hallelujah. And so I. Uh, was teaching a Bible study to a guy named Christian Rodriguez, and he was a college basketball player uh, at the school that I'm an alumni at, and I was teaching him a Bible study. And it was the summertime, so he had to go back to his city. And the city he was from was Fort Lauderdale, where she lived. And he was Spanish, and she went to a Spanish church. So I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to connect them with that church so he can uh, get saved. I said, hey, I, there's a great church there. Matter of fact, I got a friend that's an evangelist. He's preaching at that church. You would, you would love to go there this week. He goes, yeah, I, I want to do that. So we went back this week, and then it's coming time for the revival service on a, a Thursday night, and he 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 says, hey, can you, I, I want to go to church tonight, but I don't have a ride. Fort Lauderdale is about four and a half hours from where I live. I was like, you know what, man? It's for a soul. Got to if I just get him connected with that one time, introduce him to the evangelist. He'll get connected, and that's it. So I said, okay, I'll pick you up for church tonight. He goes, thank you so much. I'm driving. I'm about two hours away from the church. He sends me a text message and says, hey, bro, I'm not gonna be able to go to church tonight. I already drove two and a half hours. And now I'm like, oh, my word, it's going to look like I came here for her when I didn't. Like, we hadn't even flirt, flirted yet. But the, the, the excuse I had was my friend was preaching a revival there. So I was like, okay, you know, we, I'll, I'll, I'll just go. I went to the church service. We didn't talk. At the end of the service, we just said hello. All the youth group went out and ate. She ate as well. And uh, that's how we were talking in a group setting. Uh, my friend was in an extended revival. I went there the next week, and when I went there the next week, all the youth group were all hanging out. Uh, the youth group was hanging out at her house. We were all, all there, and uh, I was like, you know what? I feel like this is the one. I feel like this is the one. So I called my pastor. I stepped outside her house, and I called my pastor. I said, Pastor, I know this is the one, Pastor. The pastor was like, really? He said, let me call her pastor. He called her pastor. Like I said, she, he got the background check on her. He found out everything about her. He found out things that I didn't know. I was like, oh, okay, pastor. He goes, and then he says, I feel good about it. I was like, really? This is awesome. So I went up to her and said, hey, I would love to start courting, you know, if, if, you, if you like that. She goes, well, I got to talk to my pastor and I got to talk to my parents. I was like, okay, cool. Her pastor gave the okay. Her parents gave the okay. And we started courting June 12, 2012. And so we're courting, and I'm driving up. It's amazing what love does. I tell you what. 
I'm driving up to Fort Lauderdale like almost every week or every other week, four and a half hours. You know how much tolls that is? You're paying at least, I'm not exaggerating, you're going to pay at least $35 worth of tolls. You're going to pay at least, actually more like $40. You're going to pay about $20 on the turnpike. You're going to pay about pay about $20 going, and you're going to pay about $20 coming back. One toll is $13.70 right before you enter into Fort Lauderdale. So I'm going every, so I'm going all the time. And you know, when I go, I'm picking, picking her up. We never drove alone together. Uh, picking her up, her and her sister, I'm taking them out uh, to eat. We, we had never gone, gone alone on a date. We had gone with her sister. And so I'm paying for her and her sister's meal. And, uh, and every single time, gentlemen. <laughs> That's a tough start when you say, can't we go half? It's a rough start, rough start. <laughs> and so, and so I'm I, I'm paying for the meal, and her dad would ask, "Does she need any money?" I'm like, "No, she doesn't need any money." Every time I went home, I'm like negative forty in my bank account. Every time, overdrafted, just straight up, just like it's worth it. Hallelujah, it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. And like she's like she, she's like I said, "Look, I, get whatever you want." Are you eating tonight? Oh, I think I'm fasting. I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna just get some. I might nibble off of one one of your French fries. I'm just, <laughs> you get whatever; it's all yours, you know. Anybody know what I'm talking about out there? <laughs> you do your thing, galore. They're getting they're getting the big ice cream sundaes and stuff. Like you wanted some of it? No. <laughs> Stomach rumbling going home. <laughs> So we've been courting, a, and I'm keeping my pastor updated on how things are going. So our first text message, May 31st, 2012. Our first, we when we started courting, June 12, 2012. Now it's July, and I felt the Lord speak to me that it's time for me to propose. <laughs> Y'all looking at me crazy out there. So I went to my pastor, pastor, I feel like God spoke to me that he wants me to propose. The pastor said, okay, let me pray about it. A week later, he said, I feel good about it. As soon as we hung up the phone, I got in the car and drove four hours. And I showed up on a Thursday. I was going to propose Saturday night. But I wanted to talk with her dad, and so I showed up early. So that Thursday, I show up, and I talk to her dad, and her dad speaks primarily Spanish. And I had a really cute how I was going to ask him to propose to his daughter in Spanish. Don't ever use Google Translate. I was like, propósito matrimonio to hija, por favor. He goes, you want to ask me for permission to marry my daughter? I say, yes, I'd like to do it this Saturday with your permission. He said, tonight? I was like, no, you don't understand. Sabado, Sabado, <laughs> Sabado. He said, tonight? And then we're going to have a family meeting. What did I just get myself into? And so I told him how I was going to propose. Propose Me and Louisa, we had literally played 300 games of Uno. We played Uno all the time. We played it in person when we were apart. We played it online. Of course, I was winning. You know, I won like 175 times. I'm kidding. She was in the lead. She was in the lead. She was in the lead. But we played it all the time. And so... We went back into the house, and I told Louisa, we sat down, and I said, let's play Uno, which is common. We do that all the time. She gets the deck. She starts mixing the deck. She looks away. When she looks away, I take the deck, and I put a fixed deck of cards right there. Gave her seven, took my seven, and then 
I put my card down, and the card said, draw four. And when she drew four, it said, will you marry me? And I got on my knee, and we hugged. Come on, somebody. And the first thing she said was, did you talk to my dad? (laughs) And we had never kissed yet. We were waiting to get engaged before we kissed. And so once she said yes, I was. And right as I pucker up, her dad goes, time for the meeting. So we start this meeting, and he's like, he's like, uh, he's like, what do you have to offer my daughter? Folks, that's a tricky question, because I, I'm an overthinker. I'm, I'm a little bit analytical, so I'm thinking if I tell him what I have to offer, it could somehow come across like I've earned her, I know, I got myself in trouble. Uh, It could come across, if I start listing all the things that I can offer, it could come across like I've earned her, and I don't, she's a gift, I can't earn her. And so I told them what you should never do. I said, sir, I have nothing to offer your daughter. He said, huh? Louise is looking at me like. He said, no, no, like, do you have anything to offer? I said, sir, I have nothing to offer your daughter. <laughs> Louise is just like. And so he starts talking about Louise. He calls Louise Luisita. He's like, Luisita, I remember when she was young and, and now she's growing up and and he goes, ah! <laughs> starts breaking down crying. Let me tell you something. This is the strongest man I've ever met. This is the most scary man I've ever met. I didn't know he was capable of tears. But this man that is so scary started breaking down crying. And Louisa goes on that side of the table to comfort him. And her mom goes on that side of the table to comfort him. And it's now me, the traitor, on the opposite side of the table. And they're all comforting one another. I was like, what in the world do I do? So we still laugh about it. This is what I did. I got up from the table and I said, Lord Jesus, you know God. You can work it out, Lord. You know God. I started praying. (laughs) And then when they were, somebody needs to write a manual what to do when the dad cries. Because that's awkward. When they were done, when they were done, I was like, Lord Jesus, you know, when they were done. I was like, and then he gets up from the table and he walks over to me. And he was like, he puts his arm around my head and tucks it into his side. He goes, I don't look at this as losing a daughter, but rather gaining a son. And my head is on the ground. What is going on right now? Like, this was a surreal moment. I'm like, I'm in a state of shock. I'm like, what's happening right now? And so we wound up text message May 31st, courting June 12th, proposed August 24th. We got married November 17th. 2012 when we got married because we kept our leadership involved when they gave the charge over us there was probably 200 300 people there when they gave the charge over us the power of God began to descend in the wedding people were speaking in tongues people were people were praying one another literally there was a prayer meeting that happened in that place there was such a holiness that took place god honored it when we made sure we did it right
And the only people that knew before we got engaged, the only people that knew that we were recording was my leadership and my home church and her leadership and her home church. As a matter of fact, how the home church found out, it was actually by accident. Louisa had come to visit and I was sitting on the platform and my bishop was preaching and he goes, yeah, Victor got his girlfriend, right? Oh, my word, Bishop. He's like, come on, put it there, man. Can I tell you, the only people that need to know, your parents, your leadership, your home church. Can I tell you one of the worst things to do, especially if you want to be in leadership? One of the worst things you could do. I'm in trouble. Don't hate me. I'm going to tell you one of the worst things you could do in this age if you're going to be in leadership. One of the worst things you could do Y'all going to still love me after this? Here's one of the worst things. One of the worst things you could do is immediately after you get in a relationship put a profile picture of you two together. I'm in trouble. Brother Jackson, why are you saying that? Because coincidentally, after about a month and we see you're in that photo now alone, we know y'all broke up. And when it's the one picture in the shot, you see the comments. All you need is Jesus. <laughs> the Lord's going to work it out. He don't know what he lost. No one needs discerning of spirits. We know once it's just you, and every day y'all had pictures of y'all too, and now we see it's just you, and your last post from was like a year and a half ago. You deleted everything. If you're going to be in leadership in the future, not everyone in the outside world needs to know about it, except the people that matter. Because if it doesn't work out, it's not a big deal. Because you had permission, you went through it the right way. If it doesn't work out, okay. The whole world doesn't know about it. Does this make sense? Because the worst thing you could do, especially as a minister of the gospel, is have, in the span of three years, four different profile pictures with different girls. And it's like one person said, like, this girl saying, man, he's my world. And they're like, man, how many worlds you got? You building a whole solar system. This is, this is your fourth world. Got a whole galaxy out there. You, and you, you had the audacity to be in the same pose with different people. Hello? Six months later, different guy. Year later, the smile starts getting a little bit more fake now. <laughs> so I was like, I know this one ain't working out, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a try. Am I being real here tonight? The best thing you could do is have your leadership. Your parents know, your home church know, but other than that, you don't have to publicize it. Nobody knew that me and Louisa were courting except her church, my church, her leadership, and my leadership. And guess what? Whenever I announced on Facebook finally that we were engaged, people were like, I didn't even know y'all were talking to anybody. 
And it was just great. It was just great. Because you want to put that profile picture up? When you get engaged, when you get a commitment, put it up. Right? People mad at me. Okay, okay. I'm trying to help you, though. Because we go through your Facebook and your Instagram history, you know? You can come across like a player. You know, it's not true when, when it says, you know, it's official now because it's like social media official. It's Instagram official. It's fake, like, like people won't accept it unless it's like got the seal of the king Facebook. The seal of Instagram. Y'all not talking. I didn't see it on Instagram. No, I'm telling you, we are. No, when you put it on Instagram, I'll believe it. Come on now. It is essential to go through the proper channels in our relationships because it can make or break your walk with God. That's why God has given us counsel with the leadership that he's placed over us. The Bible says that purposes are established with counsel and purposes are disappointed without counsel. God gives counsel to you because you have such a destiny that it must be protected and you cannot throw it away because someone, as they say, slid in your DMs. If this helps somebody, can you wave a hand right now? If this hurts somebody, can you? Oh, I see, it's a lot of hurt. Click, click, click. It'll, it'll be better tomorrow, I promise. But I'm trying to help you. The secrets will destroy you. Secrets will destroy you. If you've been in a secret relationship, you need to tell somebody about it. And then get out of it. And do it properly. Because you're going to damage yourself. Everybody stand with me. Everybody stand with me. I'm excited about tomorrow. I promise you the message won't be on relationships. I promise. But there has to be that safeguard. I am where I am today because I have that apostolic safeguard, my pastor and my bishop over my life that helped me to make right decisions. I talk to my pastor once a week, once or twice a week. I talk to my bishop about once a month. People ask me, well, why you talk to the pastor once a week, but bishop only once a month? And I tell them because it's more, I'm more afraid of bishop. My bishop's scary. I speak in tongues under the breath when I'm on the phone with him. But it has kept me. It has kept me anchored. It has helped me in my future. And they can see things from a perspective that you can't see. That will help you because they can see you going, having a great destiny that you don't even see yet. So they could tell you, no, 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 don't, don't do it. That, that guy's a loser. Right? Like, no, actually, I know something uh, that's going on with that family. You don't want to mess with that right now. It's just going to break your heart. You don't even see it yet. But I thank God for a shepherd that can watch over my soul. Can you lift up your hands right now? And let's ask God to give us the wisdom and understanding to help us make right decisions. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask you to shed to light 
in the minds and hearts of these young people to help them make a right decision to love you with all their heart to honor you in their relationships and friendships in the name of Jesus Amen I want you to hear this one last thing you want to know if your relationship is in the will of God or not I dare you to tell them hey I'm going on a three day fast I'm going on a three day consecration I won't be talking to anybody on the phone for three days if they won't honor your commitment they're not for you anyone that doesn't honor your commitment to the Lord isn't for you. If you go on a three-day and say, I can't talk to you, I'm focusing on the Lord, and they're sending you text messages every day not listening to you, they don't respect your walk with God. And they've pushed you above God. You don't want anybody like that. You want somebody to be like, you know what, I respect that. They won't honor your consecration. They won't honor you. If they don't honor their parents, that is evidence that they won't honor your parents. They're always talking down about their mom. They're always talking down about their dad. When the word of God says honor your parents, if they won't do that for their parents, they won't honor your parents. I'm helping you for your future. And I feel that there's been conviction in this house. And tonight, I don't want us to pray off the conviction. I want it to settle in on us. So close your eyes and lift up your hands one more time. And just ask the Lord to seal this word in your heart and seal this word in your mind and seal this word in your spirit. I feel lives have been changed here. I feel lives have been taken out of the fire and thrust into the will of God. You may have to send a text message tonight and end that relationship. You know in your heart it wasn't going to work. Lay it down and allow God to give you who he wants you to have for his glory. In the name of Jesus. Can you clap your hands to the Lord right now? help anybody in here. Amen. That was, you know, sometimes if you're focused on emotion, you can completely miss what God is doing in the spirit. Some services are going to be blowing and going and some services are going to be God just putting that seed exactly where it needs to be delicate fashion and that's what God was doing don't ever miss what God is doing because your expectation is you expect something that has to happen like it happened last night that that was a word from that right there could save your soul like he said save your destiny I thank God that I followed the Holy Ghost in finding my wife I thank God for that and guess what? You don't know that on the other side until you get married. And then you find out, wow, thank God I made that right decision. So listen to somebody who's got wisdom, who's telling you they did it right and God is blessing them and God is using them. It, the time is too short. The time is too short. God is wanting to pour out a spirit and do 
powerful things in this earth and you are the vessels that he's raising up i don't care if you're 15 or you're 45 it doesn't matter you are the vessels that god is raising up and it is critical for us to do the will of god especially in the biggest decision of our life aside from our walk with god and choosing him the biggest decision of your life this was a seed that you need to water and you need to let this grow because there's going to come a day when you're going to have to make some decisions and i hope to god that you remember this message in jesus name praise god well we're about to fellowship so maybe you'll find your wife in a few minutes <laughs> totally kidding totally kidding because you have to talk to your pastor first right brother jackson you're gonna have to pray about it yeah <laughs> that we might see a line up to the pastor that's true he might his phone might get overloaded you know with all the text and phone calls but you know let's uh let's give him some time um but <laughs> with that being said we've got pizza we've got sloppy joe's downstairs five dollars but please come down we're not going to be outside obviously because of the weather uh, but we're going to be downstairs in the fellowship hall come down and fellowship uh get to get to meet some people and just have a good time see some old friends and uh, brother jackson will be with us at antioch central tomorrow morning and tomorrow night thank you all for coming to back to school revival and please do not forget what was said on thursday last night and tonight and take this home with you we love you we appreciate you and of course back to school revival we'll see you next year but meet us downstairs in jesus name